Bonjour tout le monde et merci d'être venu au séminaire RQMP de, qui sera donné par Fabio Boschini de l'INRS. Et donc aujourd'hui, ça devrait être André-Marie Tremblay qui était censé être ici à ma place, mais étant donné qu'il s'est fait mal au dos, donc c'est moi ici, mais je vais lire le texte que André-Marie a très gentiment écrit. Donc, le comportement des électrons dans les matériaux fortement corrélés est un sujet qui fascine plusieurs d'entre nous à l'Institut quantique. Il est maintenant possible de sonder la matière de nouvelles façons, ce qui donne accès à la dynamique des électrons comme jamais auparavant. Notre conférencier d'aujourd'hui est bien placé pour se mener à la frontière de ce domaine. Originaire de l'Italie, il a fait ses études doctorales à l'Université de la Colombie-Britannique dans le groupe d'Andrea Damascelli. Il a mis au point une expérience unique au Canada d'Arpès résolu en temps. Et situé à l'INRS à Varennes, il s'agit d'une installation disponible pour les usagers. Et parmi ces travaux récents, j'aimerais souligner que grâce à des expériences pompe-sonde, il a mis en évidence l'origine du sous-gap dans les, dans les couperades dopées aux électrons. Il a déterminé la force de l'interaction électron-phonon pour un phonon spécifique. Il a montré qu'il était possible de détruire la supraconductivité dans les couperates en détruisant seulement la, conférence de, la, la cohérence des phases. Donc, accueillez avec moi et Fabio Bostini. Merci. Merci pour l'introduction. Je suis très heureux d'être ici. Finalement, j'ai visité ma première fois à Sherbrooke et j'ai eu l'opportunité de vous montrer quelques résultats récents avec les deux via Timer Solarpers at uh, INRS uh, in Varenne, and also some recent results on studying dynamical charge correlations in cuprate superconductor via uh, Rick's spectroscopy. So this is the outline of my talk, let's see also for people connected via Zoom. At the beginning, I'm gonna give you a general introduction on the time and angular resolved emissions system at uh, Uh, INRS, uh, precisely in the Advanced Laser Light Source Laboratory at INRS. Uh, after that, I'm going to move to uh, discuss some extremely preliminary results that we recently obtained with this uh, system, where we are going to discuss a bit the uh, feature or the, the appearance of a putative topological exciton in three-dimensional topology insulator. And after that, I'm going to move to, towards uh, Uh, the, uh, uh, the work, uh, recent work, uh, that now is an archive hopefully published soon, where we track dynamic charge correlations within the whole two-dimensional momentum space in a BISCO 212. So uh, let me start talking about uh, ALS. ALS uh, uh, is a national user facility and has been uh, founded since, uh, well, uh, 2010 or earlier by CFI, Uh, Quebec government, and of course now it's part also of LaserNet US. And since last year, uh, we we are officially a national user facility thanks to funding from a CFI in, within the MSI uh, grant funding scheme. And uh, ALS is a facility that uh, delivers uh, a pretty broad rainbow of ultra short pulses from the terahertz to X-ray and potentially also uh, electron beams via a series of uh, primary sources. So both ethereum-based uh, and titanium sapphire-based laser sources. And then via secondary sources, we generate all the light needed to feed our end stations. So we have several end stations. And in particular, of course, today I'm going to discuss uh, mainly and solely about the ARPES end station that has been built in collaboration with Francois Ligare, and here I'm showing you also my PhD students, postdoc, and the research associate uh, I did, I mean, they collaborated uh, so far to uh, the commissioning of this uh, novel time and, and angular soft emission station. So these are recent pictures. Uh, so we have uh, uh, this uh, upper end station. Uh, the moment we are uh, uh, working with uh, low photon energy probe light, so 6 V light at 250 kilohertz, We can pump our systems with uh, mid-infrared, near-infrared light from uh, 0.8 to 0.1 EV. And in the near future, we really hope to allow or 
design a system to pump our system in an RPS environment with a terahertz pump pulses or sub 100 millivolt. Why well, that would be important because then we can couple directly to collective modes of materials like phonons, minions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, few words about the system. Well, this is a state of the art type of system. We have a closed cycle cryostat. Uh, we can measure from eight well, at a uh, Kelvin temperature below 10K, let's say 8K on the sample, up to 700K potentially, all in the minus uh, 11 millibar scale. Fully motorized manipulator. But I would say the key feature of this system is uh, the new emissary analyzer. Uh, the Astraios uh, uh, 190 by specs that allows us to detect photometered electron within uh, a cone of emission of 60 degree. Consider that the previous uh, deflector technology for uh, atmospheric analyzer were allowing a maximum acceptance angle of 30 degree. So this is a you know a factor two better. Uh, of course, in the future we also plan to extend uh, our probe from a low photon energy 6EV to uh, XUV, so from 10 to 40 uh, EV. Why do we need to do that? Well, that is the only way to explore the full momentum space of quantum materials, or reach the edges uh, of the brilliant zone of the materials we are interested in. And uh, we already installed, you can notice the picture on the, the, oh, the top, we already installed our monochromator, a focus in line. We just need to connect to the upper system. And this is a time preserving monochromator. So that allows us, we generate uh, XUV light, 10 to 40V via high ammonia generation. We are going to monochromatize it via time preserving monochromator and very focus on the, on the sample. And uh, with this uh, scheme, we will be able to select the harmonics we want to send to the, to the system from 10EV to 40V, more or less. And hopefully this is going to be operational, let's say, before the end of the year or beginning of 2024. So let me spend a few words on uh, the technique, of course, uh, very, very briefly. So Angular's photo, photo mission allows you to directly measure the electronic band structure material. How it works, well, uh, this is already showing you the Inapres map on the topology isolator where you can clearly see the uh, data like uh, dispersion. And what happens is that, well, we just shine some light on the material, UV light. We take advantage of the photoelectric effort. We remove an electron. And by detecting the angle of emission and the kinetic energy of our photometered electron, we can uh, simply apply energy and momentum conservation laws and the related angle of emission and the kinetic energy of a photometered electron to its burning energy and its crystal momentum inside the solid. And so point by point, we can reconstruct the electronic band dispersion of our materials. Now, uh, angular photo mission uh, is uh, a pretty well-established technique uh, since uh, the 70s, even before. And uh, clearly in the past 20 years has seen uh, a clear increase in the publication and the experimental efforts. And you clearly see what really drove the <laughs> technical advancements of the technique. And this is why still today we are really happy to measure coup rates via photomission. Uh, but anyway, uh, today we are uh, at a situation where our energy resolution is uh, of the order of milliV, even better than milliV. So we can really look at really low energy spectral feature of a variety of quantum materials with uh, exquisite indeed uh, uh, resolution and, uh, and data quality. If now we want to take the technique and uh, extend into the time domain, simply we take advantage of a pump probe technique. So we need to use a pump pulse to perturb our system and uh, a probe pulse to photometer electron and look at what the pump induced into inside the material. Of course, if the pump is arriving after the probe, the probe does not see any effort of the pump. Therefore, we measure the first approximation, the electronic dispersion we had without the pump. When pump and probe are overlap, we simply, well, to the first approximation, we just promote carriers from below to above the, the Fermi level. So one could say that we assess unoccupied states. And then uh, on a time scale or intrinsic time scale of the material, we can track ultra fast relaxation dynamics and therefore have information or start information about the uh, intrinsic scattering properties of the material. Um, in a different way, well, as you can see, it's a pretty young technique that is uh, uh, recently, in the past 10 years, uh, 
show some, uh, well, the number of publication clearly increases, not, uh, we cannot really find the material that trigger really the development of a technique like cuprates for photomission. But clearly more and more groups are developing new systems and the number of publications and interest in the technique is uh, uh, constantly growing. I want also to say that so far the technique has been uh, um, applied to a wide variety of uh, quantum materials, for instance, topology insulator, cuprates, acetonic insulator, TMDs, charge order materials. And uh, if you're interested, hopefully in the next year, it's going to be out a review mode in physics on the technique where indeed we describe all what the technique has achieved in the past 10, 15 years. Now, today, I want to focus on a specific problem. Excitons. And the one who wonder at the beginning is that, okay, how can you probe an exciton via ARPES? Because the point of that, right, an exciton is an electron roll uh, pair that are bound by coulomb interaction. ARPES photometer an electron. How can I probe an exciton via timers of ARPES? So let's consider this scheme here. So we have uh, an electron and the doll that are bound. So I have a semiconductor with energy gap. Uh, E.g., at a certain point, these two electron all, of course, of the bound form an exciton with a, a certain binding energy. So the energy of the exciton is just the band gap minus the binding energy. Let's say that now I had some light that I'm going to use to photometer the, the electron. So now the energy of this system, where I just consider the exciton plus light, is this initial energy. So just the photon energy plus the energy of the exciton. Now, Let's pass through the photomission process. So I remove my electron. So electron and all are not anymore bound. And so what happens is that I photometer this electron. For, so this electron has now an energy that is the work function of the material plus the kinetic energy, excess energy above the work function, but also left behind an all. And so the whole has also its own energy, right? But depends indeed of, the, of our uh, mass of the uh, of all in the valence band. However, the energy of the system is exactly the same. So I apply energy conservations. And in this way, I can extract the momentum relation of the kinetic energy of our photometer electron. And the main point is the, is the following. If you photomit from an exciton, the dispersion that you extract tracks or mimics the dispersion of the valence band. Just because in the photomission process, you're leaving behind a hole with a dispersion that is tracking the dispersion of the of valence band. This is just, a, in a naive way, the, what we would expect from a, in a photomission uh, uh, spectrum to serve as a signature of, a, of an exciton. And indeed, this has been experimentally verified. Uh, by what well, Okinawa group uh, two, three years ago uh, provided the first direct evidence of the formation of the exciton in a TMD. This is monolayer tungsten diselenide, where we serve indeed the appearance of exciton feature, both a bright exciton or dark exciton below the bottom of the conduction band in TMD. But not only they did that, but also they track the dispersion of the excitonic feature that. It's a bit broad, but still the curvature or whatever it tracks, it mimics the dispersion of the balance band and not the dispersion of the conduction band. Since then, better results has been, uh, has been uh, published and uh, also different materials have been, uh, uh, been investigated, reporting indeed the appearance of excitonic feature for other TMDs and also on uh, copper oxides. Yeah, please. Of so what happens is that uh, when you are strut is not the dispersion of the exciton, that is the signature of the exciton via photomission. So the fact that we are breaking the exciton and photometer an electron, the photometer electron is mimicking the dispersion of the valence band post approximation. This again approximation that you are photometing from a Q equal zero exciton, so a bright exciton, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In reality, it's a bit more complicated than that. We'll follow the condition band. 
should be underneath the conduction band and should follow the conduction band. However, the fact that this is a, a, a two particle, right? The exciton is just a, a letter and all plus. The fact that I'm emitting a hole and I have a, I'm emitting a letter and the hole is left behind, what you serve is indeed the dispersion of the balance. So if you had the uh, valence and uh, conduction band with uh, extremely different masses, then you should see a very, very big difference between indeed the dispersion that you would expect for the accident and the dispersion that really you measure via photomission. It's a bit uh, counterintuitive, counter but it's, uh, it's been verified. And also there are uh, several uh, theory papers now here, I just uh, set in two, but where indeed predict this kind of behavior. Okay, however, today I'm gonna to focus on the recent report of a topological exciton on the surface of, oh, in a uh, three-dimensional topology insulator. It's been a, this has been recently published, uh, I think uh, in February, uh, 2023 where um, uh, they took uh, a P-dope bismuth telluride. So we have our topological insulator with uh, direct like dispersion of the topological surface state with a Fermi level that is crossing the valence band. The pump system populates the topological surface state and then they saw the appearance of some intensity, a blob of intensity just below the bottom of the conduction band. And by assign this feature to a topological exciton. Why they call this topological exciton? Simply because the idea is that uh, the holes stays in the bulk, while the electrons that we separated, they accumulate at the surface. So here in this position, we have uh, the hybridization between the topological surface state and the conduction band. So these electrons were, that we are photosetting, that we are photosetting are mainly localized at the surface. So in there, uh, uh, what we discuss is that in this case, we have uh, this exciton that survives for a very long time here. I show an image of 40 picoseconds simply because this electron and all, they cannot really recombine. So they're bound, they cannot really recombine. And also this exciton is a certain spin structure that I'm gonna show you later. Anyway, the first point in support to this uh, evidence was uh, uh, was uh, is alighted on this figure on the right, where here I'm plotting the what is called a, a differential RPS map. So I measure the map at a certain delay, let's say 40 picosecond. I subtract the map before the pump excitation. So what you see here is a, a red increase of counts. In this case, is I'm adding electron, and the blue is decrease of counts. In this case, we can uh, interpret them as alls. So we say in this case, we clearly see that uh, we have alls that survives in this position for 40 picosecond. We have electron that are localized here after 40 picosecond, these two are bound. So it's a sort, sort of Q equals zero exciton. The second point in support to this, uh, uh, in support of, to this topological exciton is that the track indeed where this exciton feature was appearing. And the main point was the following, that the exciton feature appears below the conduction band. If we, if we have an exciton, the exciton should be below the conduction band with a certain binding energy. And so what we're probing, we say, okay, here we, we can just take this uh, energy, energy distribution curve, so plot the photomission intensity for a certain momentum and look at the spectral weight, how is evolving over time? I would say, oh, you see the conduction band is, is peak here, and then after some time, all the spectral weight is accumulating few milliv below the conduction band. Yes. The pump and probe. Yes. Oh, my question is that, that this time was just a delay between the pump and the probe. The just, is it's, it's, exactly. The pump is just creating this non equilibrium. Uh, distribution of carriers. And then if you wait enough time, the carriers accumulate. In this case, we're proposing that we're forming an exit. Okay. The third point in support is that they did also uh, spin resolve timers of ARPES and were able to detect uh, a spin polarization associated to the Citoni feature. Okay. And so the picture here on the right or in the, in the center is sort of uh, a schematic of uh, what we are proposing is that we have our holes in the balance band that are uh, spin polarized up. 
the conduction band is not spin polarized, while the exciton feature, the electrons have a, a down spin polarization. Now, in our case, while we are commissioning our time and angle resolve photomission system at NRS, you know, the first thing when you commission time resolve system, you measure topological insulator. Why? Because uh, they give a, a huge signal and we use them to find the pump probe overlap because the signal is so huge that it's very, very easy. So uh, we were really doing, uh, we had other plans that I'm going to show you two slides later, what we are really investigating. But anyway, we had the PDOP bismuth telluride. So we pump the system. And these, are, these are our data. After 50, 50 picoseconds, we still see that uh, carriers of the population is still present, so a very long decay. And if we just focus around the feature where we expect to see this exciton feature, we clearly see, well, we didn't work too hard on the color scale, but you clearly see that we have accumulation of carriers is all in the same position that has been, uh, where it been pre previously reported. Now, what we did before moving to the next slide, what we can do is that with this current analyzer is that without moving the sample, we can acquire electron emitted within a cone of emission of 60 degree. This means that usually in a ARPES, we detect electron only along the slit direction. So let's say plus minus 30 degree. And we can call that as KX, so parallel momentum along X direction as a function of binding energy. However, you can also deflect your photometer electron, so you can detect this electron at different KY. So you can reconstruct what is called Fermi surface. We can do this in a timer solve fashion. So we can pump, we can acquire the Fermi surface with a pump excitation, and we can subtract the Fermi surface before the pump excitation. And we can, comp or we can, I can show you uh, a differential Fermi surface. In particular, you can see this video. Now let's look at the first time. What I'm, what I'm seeing here is a differential map, a different KY, where the blue is the decrease, the red is increase of population, and at the bottom, oh sorry, that is missing KX. The bottom we have KX, top we have bonding energy, and then this number that is changing here on top now is in angle. It's just the angle of emission along the perpendicular direction, so it's sort of KY. Let me launch this again. So you see that these are different KY, we, we see the cone, a different uh, depletion around, et cetera, et cetera. So now it's a bit complicated to follow what is going on here. So let's, we plot the different ISO energy contourn, differential ISO energy contourn at four different panning energy, 150 millivv above the Fermi level. Of course, you just see the population of the Dira cone, uh, zero millivv minus 150 minus 250. First of all, notice this. Here, if we compare to these previous results, we're seeing depletion, so accumulation of faults, only very close to our Diracon. So it would be these four points along gamma M. However, we clearly see in reality that alls are also present in a balanced band that is pretty far away from our zone center. In addition, if you look also below a different energy, well, it's very difficult to identify the old reservoir that indeed is bound to these electrons. So are we looking at indirect exciton, not only a direct exciton or exciton with Q different than zero? So to be honest, after this experimental evidence, where to be honest, we're gonna look at this and say, hey, look, I have all everywhere. Do we really see an exit or not? So let's try to look at the exit on the feature. The idea is that can we reproduce this experimental evidence of exit on the feature appearing below the bottom of the conduction band? So we acquire our spectrum, our static spectrum at 50 picosecond and 1.5 picosecond. What we can just do is, in our case, we have a pretty large momentum space we acquire all at the same time. So we can see both a plus minus K exciton. And we can just plot in a similar fashion that was a, what has been published, just how this ADC evolve over time. So how the spectral weight is evolving over time. This is what we, what we observe, sorry, that it maybe is a bit scattered, but eventually we see exactly the same feature, that in reality we have a feature that is centered around 0 0.2 in our case here, and then after 20, 40 picosecond is moving few millivy 
down below the conduction band, let's say. However, what I want to point out is the following. If we consider to have a basic semiconductor, for instance, here I'm showing a, a recent work by the group of uh, uh, Luca Perfetti on indium selenium. And here they just change cesium doping, so they're just changing the doping. But let's focus only on panel A, B, C. So panel A is the conduction band with a very low doping, where we see indeed the electron just accumulated at the bottom of the conduction band. If now I pump and I increase the number of carriers in our conduction band, we see panel B. This is the pump excitation. However, what I want to point out is that if you're looking at the position of these two peaks, they are not the same. But clearly, the one with higher electronic temperature, the peaks appear at higher binding energy simply because we have a certain density of state. You have a certain accumulation of carriers. If you increase the number of carriers, you're going to have a peak that appears simply at higher binding energy. So, the point is that you don't need to have two features to give two peaks at different binary energy, but simply you can have just a certain density state, just a conduction band in the normal semiconductor, just add carriers, and that would appear like the peak is moving. Let's check if this is the case. Again, well, of course, before uh, doing that, one can also try to fit the position of the conduction band. This is our conduction band. We can fit the position. And of course, if we check the binding energy of this exciton, say, well, yeah, you see that it's clearly below our conduction band. However, we just need not, we, we need to be careful not to confuse the center of our conduction band to the overall density of state associated to the conduction band. And as you can see, in fact, also here on the side, the conduction band has a very broad feature. So what is the functional form of a conduction band in energy for that K exciton? So what we can do is simply this. Again, we have a high statistic image. We can just look at the ADC for two different K. And this is the blue is for minus K exciton. The, the orange is for plus K exciton, what we expect to see underneath this curve are two different components. The first one is the one of a topological surface state. The second one should be a broad conduction band. Now, the nice thing that we acquire these two different, we have two different curves that compass the two different components with different spectral weight or with different weight for the two different components, we can uh, use a different experimental strategies to extract the functional form of a conduction band. For instance, we can just subtract the blue to the, to the orange, applying a multiplication fat. Or one can fit the low energy tail of the topological surface state and they say, OK, the topological surface state is the Lorentzian. Let's subtract that, let's subtract that let, and find out what is the shape of the conduction band. We can do this, and this is what you obtain. Two different methods. Be scattered, uh, as I said, the prelim preliminary results. We would like to verify this, but overall we have this shape. And if now I add to this shape the feature associated to the exciton after 50 picosecond, what we notice is that it's not separated from the density of state of the conduction band, but reality is false at the edge of the conduction band. So this. Uh, makes me a bit suspicious. And in order to also support this claim, one can also do this exercise. Let's imagine that this is the density state of our conduction band. Uh, we are in a semiconductor. Let's imagine to have a quasi Fermi level at the edge of our uh, conduction band with a certain temperature. And if you assume a temperature 150, that is a sort of a spectral feature with expect by accumulation of carriers at the bottom of the conduction band. I superimpose the exciton. So, well, um, needs to be verified. Of course, uh, I don't have access to uh, spin result timers of ARPES, really to dis discuss the third point in support to the exit on the feature. However, 
our experimental evidence show that uh, probably, um, first of all, it's not really possible to identify what holes, if it's really an exciton, what holes are contributing to the formation of the exciton, or if we have direct and indirect exciton forming after pump excitation. But also, the simplest possible explanation that is just a, an accumulation of carriers at the bottom of the conduction band explains or captures well our experimental evidence. So uh, we would like to, of course, uh, to do a further measurements, and hopefully in the next few months, in just to verify whether this is really an exciton or not. And at ALS, the nice thing is that we can uh, not only pump a 1.5 V with near infrared visible light, but we can pump with mid infrared light. We can pump with 200 millV, 300 millV. So potentially we can directly populate this feature. Can we have uh, a direct optical excitation of exciton and the exciton appearing? We can do this kind of stuff. We can try. We're going to try. But I mentioned at the beginning that this was not our plan. This uh, investigative this exciton feature was not our. Uh, initial plan on uh, bismuth telluride. We'll, what we want to do is uh, explore flow cave physics. So use intense light excitation to add a sort of perturbative, time-dependent Hamiltonian to our system. So to replicate the band structure along energy and hybridize original and flow cave band replicas. And this is the first measurements that we did, the preliminary measurements we did in November, again, on this bismuth telluride. But it times zero pump with 300 millV. And well, it's very difficult with this color scale. I can just show the second derivative. But in the second derivative, what you clearly observe that this is before the pump excitation. When we pump, we create a direct replica of the cone, exactly the photon energy of 300 millV. And indeed, where we expect to serve a crossing between the topologies of a state and the bottom balance band, where we also have the topology of surface state, we have a drop of intensity. But then again, surely gets filled up after some time. These are extremely pre pre preliminary results uh, with a system that was not perfectly commissioned. As I say, when we acquired these results, the energy resolution of the system was around 60 millV. Not great, now it's 10 millV. So now we can really extract the gaps and try to see if this is uh, a floquet gap, and also we can explore this over the full moment of space. We are very interested in looking at bismuth telluride because there is a, the cone has a certain K warping, so the spin orientation is pretty complex. I'm, I'm, I would be very interested to understand it is indeed the spin orientation, uh, eventual K as an effort on the opening of gaps, of floquet gaps or not. Okay, this is the end of the first part of my talk. Now, in the next 10 minutes, I just would like to show you recent uh, RICS results where we investigated, in fact, the low, low energy quasi-circular electron correlation in uh, bismuth-based cuprates. This work uh, uh, is the results of uh, an extensive collaboration among uh, several groups. In particular, my closest collaborations are Eduardo da Silvaneto, Yale, and uh, Alex Frano, UC San Diego. We perform measurements at uh, three different uh, uh, RICS facilities, uh, Diamond High 21, to uh, the RICS beamline at NLS2 at Brookhaven National Laboratories at, uh, and the QRICS at ALS in Berkeley. We perform uh, restaurant in elastic ray scattering, restaurant to the copper L3 edge to indeed uh, start information about uh, uh, charge modulation in the copper valence electrons. So just we shine some uh, uh, X ray beam at 932 EV resonant to the copper L3 edge. And we look at not only the scattering angle of this uh, uh, X-ray beam, but also the beam pass through a spectrometer and we can look at all the colors. So all the energy losses associated to the scattering process. And we can extract therefore information about the momentum dispersion of the ponons, minons, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what we want to investigate are these dynamic electron correlations associated to the conventional charge order. In the past few years, uh, the community has reported indeed that uh, the conventional charge order in cuprates is not purely static, but there is a dynamic component. Both in the low energy 
region, let's say sub 70 millV, where indeed uh, the last peak in the recent si uh, science by Arpaia, Giacomo Gringelli's group, we observed that the last peak was not really associated to the charge order, it's not really center zero, but it's shifted few tens of millV, 10, 10, 20 millV. But also, other work on, for instance, electron decuprates, NCC or mercury based cuprates, where indeed uh, charge order has been reported even on energy scale in the mid infrared range, 200, 500 millivy. However, all this work has been, here I say almost exclusively, I think all of this has been just performed or along QS, along the copper oxygen direction, or along the diagonal. No one has really investigated what is going on between these two different directions. Two years ago, we performed a study on uh, uh, bismuth uh, 2212. This case is under DOP 60, where indeed the, we reported the appearance of dynamic electron correlations with the same Q vector of a charge order, uh, but with a uh, quasi-circular shape. In particular, here I'm showing a symmetrized map where you see that the, the dark, uh, the dark uh, blobs of intensity, the dark pattern of intensity are associated with a conventional charge order, but these are connected by a dynamic ring that we are able to identify within uh, the mid-infrared region between 500 to 900 mV. However, these results indicate the presence of a dynamic charge correlation in the medium further energy region. However, they were performed with a pretty bad or medium, let's say, energy resolution of around 800 millivy. So the point is, can we really verify whether these dynamic charge correlation are present even in the low energy range? Why we would like to do that? Well, because Dynamic charge correlations, if we really have a dynamic charge correlation along all possible directions, this could be very interesting to, for discussing or to explain, for instance, the strange metal behavior that, is, uh, that has been reported in cuprates, for instance. So there's been indeed uh, this recent rigs and transport uh, work, again, by uh, uh, Arpaia and the Wahlberg, uh, published two years ago. But there is our work, as I said, on uh, dynamic charge correlations, and also, right, in uh, recent uh, work coming out from the, from here, from Sherbrooke, right, uh, you reported uh, an isotropic uh, scattering rate associated potentially with t linear resistivity. So the idea is that can we really verify whether this quasi-circular dynamic correlation exists at low energy? Because then we'll play a role to discuss transport. Of course, in order to do that, we need a better energy resolution. And of course, if I'm showing this slide, it uh, means that we found them. Otherwise, I would not have presented. I would not have given all this uh, uh, introduction. But the idea is, yes, we can uh, extract them with uh, a better energy resolution, or 37 millV. But it's almost state of the art. So the first thing that one could think, the first experimental strategy uh, to extract uh, uh, quasi circular dynamic correlation from the risk spectrum would be to, um, to do a conventional fit. So uh, I want to guide you through uh, a, the fit, uh, the problematics associated to a fit of the risk spectrum. So these are two risk spectrum that we obtain at along the copper oxygen direction, uh, phi equals zero, so Q, along QX, or a phi 30 degree. So this is a complete away from the copper oxygen direction. And in both of them, what you serve, you serve uh, an elastic line, a phonon, the bond strength in phonon, a phonon replica, very small, a paramannon, and potentially a background. Now, the point is that uh, already with these components, we can fit very well the risk spectrum. It would be extremely difficult to add additional components. In fact, we could add uh, a component associated with quasi circular dynamic correlation, maybe in the mid infrared region. But is it really possible? Because then I would say that the fit does not need uh, additional components. And we already have 15 parameters plus convolution. Well, I can fit whatever I want. I can add 30 parameters. It's going to fit. So we don't think that conventional fit analysis do work in this case. We believe that there is something in the background. 
how can we start that? Well, there is a, a, a different strategy to do that, and the strategy consists in looking at the softening of the bond stretching mode. In a, a recent work two years ago by Wei Sheng Li, Bruceur indeed for optimally dope BISCO 2212 and also for BISCO 2201, that the bond stretching phonon softened a Q vector of the charge order uh, correlations. And, um, uh, and that is a direct signature of the interaction between this phonon and dynamic, ch dynamic charge correlations. Why this is a good approach? Well, first of all, um, the nice thing of this bond stretching phonon is that is weakly dispersing both from uh, uh, gamma to pi pi, and also in, as a function of phi, so for different direction, does not show a change in dispersion. In addition, uh, the electron phonon uh, is weakly phi dependent. So in reality, the electron phonon should not play a role for extracting the phi dependence of uh, the softening. So this is what we did. We track the phonon softening as function of the, uh, of the azimuthal angle. So these are our uh, measurements, phi equals zero along the copper region direction. This is the phonon, both stretching phonon. This is, have been measured at TC, 60K for under dope uh, 60, BISCO 2212. We report a clear softening of our uh, phonon along the copper region direction, as has been already reported before. We can measure along the diagonal. Here, we don't really see any softening. And now, now let's move a bit out, 25 degree. 30 degree, 35 degree. Well, what you serve in this case is that the softening is always present and is always around the Q vector associated with charge order correlation or is the same Q vector of conventional charge order, more or less. You can place all these points together. We measure both below and above TC and there are a few points, but clearly, shows that reality, the position of the softening is, uh, is not changing within our uh, experimental uncertainty. It could maybe move, but we cannot say anything about that. So, however, just this is a concluding slide, this work show that uh, sort of we found a connection between uh, what we previously reported of this uh, dynamic charge correlation, but in the mid infrared region, we a tandem EV energy resolution and this recent new experimental strategy that allows you indeed to extract wherever low energy charge correlation with a quasi circular pattern are present. And we really believe that the fact that potentially we have a quasi isotropic charge correlation with energies below 70 millivi, we cannot really say what is the energy scale. We know that it's below the phonon energy. It's 10, 20, 30, 40 millivi, we don't know. We cannot really assign an energy scale, but we believe that uh, their, present sh their presence should be taken into account to discuss transport property properties of, of these materials. Uh, last slide, again, I, I advertise uh, uh, once again, uh, our uh, time and go resolve automation system at ALS. Um, the system is operational and you can apply. You can submit a proposal to use the system. I think when the next call is going to be in July 2023. You can just uh, write a short proposal, submit to us, uh, to us, and we are going to evaluate it and potentially give you a uh, bin time. In, also, in addition, also, we are looking for a PhD and postdoc position. So if any of you is interested, please contact me. And with this, uh, I'm done. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Fabio, for the nice talk. Uh, the room is open for questions. Okay, thank you for this uh, this nice talk. Uh, I have a question about the last part, basically. Yep. Can you say anything about the actual, I mean, regarding charge order, the actual shape of it, not the Q vector, but where this occurs within uh, the unit cell, say? Or is, it, is that possible? So, if I understand well, uh, uh, you 
we can identify in this case that uh, charge order is, let's say, as an energy scale is dynamic. So it's not purely static. It's not just uh, located at uh, uh, omega equals zero. But also, that is not only localized have along QX or QY. So it's not uh, just localized along the crystallographic direction. But in reality, we have this dynamic correlation that is everywhere in momentum space. And why can we say that? Let's see if I can here. This is sort of a kind of picture one could have in mind. If one would imagine to have conventional charge order just localized uh, along the crystallographic axis, but very broad peaks. So what means an extremely short range charge order, that is the sort of evidence we have for cuprates. This could still give or could still result in a softening of the phonon, but the softening would not be localized at the Q vector of a charge order along the axis, but will show this kind of phi dependence. The softening will move towards the center of the zone. While if you imagine to have charge correlations everywhere in momentum space with a sort of ring, is the only way we can reproduce the softening. So from the point of view of location, this is two, two dimensions. So we don't expect to have any L dependence along QZ. In a QX, QY plane, we have a sort of dynamic charge order with a quasi-circular uh, symmetry in energy sub the phonon energy. I don't know if it is 20, 30, 50 milliV, 10 milliV, potentially standing even higher in energy because we have a previous result, but it's extremely difficult. Then it gets extremely broad. As a, we don't have any other way to really that. In reality, there is a way to detect, to really extract if charge order is present even ab above 100 milliV. And we're already doing some experiments in that, uh, in that sense is would be to do, um, the way is to do polarimetric rigs. Because the point is that when you have a charge order signature at 300, 400 milliV, that signature is overlapped with a conventional paramanon. So are we measuring the paramanon? Is this related to just the functional form of the paramanon in QSQY? Well, if you do polarimetric rigs and you separate uh, spin flip events, then you can try to see if a conventional charge order is also present at a medium thread range. Right. Okay. So, I mean, I guess it's not exactly my question, but I mean, I, I take it. Yeah. This is quite an, an interesting point. But uh, I mean, we sort of know that the, the charge order affects the charge is basically taken from the oxygens, not the copper. I mean, that's the usual, the, the conventional wisdom as far as the charge order is concerned. But this is this type of local information is not something you have access to, or is it? No. In in this uh, in this case, again, this we are looking at uh, copper L three edge. So we are looking at okay. the copper bar. You are looking at the copper. I'm looking at the copper. Okay. I'm looking at the copper. It's not yeah, any related to stripes or. Exactly. So, no, no, yeah. Okay. Good. That answers my question. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thanks for the very nice talk. Uh, I have a question about the, um, uh, the first part of the talk yeah. where you're extracting the positions of the connection bands and maybe what you, you, yeah. you see is maybe an exit on band. So I was wondering about the matrix elements. Okay. Effects yeah. in our place because since you're looking in the end at peaks in the density of states, this can maybe change a bit by uh, be changed a bit by the matrix element. So I was wondering how you manage this uh, this part in the analysis of the data. So again, I mentioned these are extremely prelim preliminary data, right? However, the nice thing here is that you see clearly that by by matrix element for negative k, I clearly see the conduction band. For positive K, I'm missing some conduction band, but then is there appearing the a of exciton. All the previous work has been done in very similar experimental uh, working parameters, but we are focused only a plus K. If I show you again the images from uh, the, the work has been, that has been published, we're just a plus K. Of course, you should consider the presence of matrix element. However, we are using as polarized light for the uh, two photometer electron. So this means it's perpendicular to the slit. And in this case, in topology insulator, the Dirac cone is pretty uniform. 
between plus and minus k. So the contribution of the Dirac cone, the topological surface state, more or less the spectral weight for the two branches, plus minus k, is very similar. Okay. So one can really one can really use that to your advantage. And of course, the uh, the conduction band is different. So you can adjust, uh, as I said, I use both, uh, you can fit the topology of the state, subtract it, you can subtract one of the curve to the other to start. We need uh, you know to verify maybe different photon energies, maybe different directions, et cetera, et cetera. But I want to want to show that is a fair point. Um let's see if I have here. You can really see that uh, in the previous image, right? As you can see, that bulk band is different matrix element, right? When you look at the conduction band, minus k, the conduction band was stronger, higher spread weight. If you look at the valence band, it's the opposite. So, of course, you need to consider that. Uh, the best would be really to, to simulate the the, the matrix that is extremely complex. What I was saying is that uh, to the first approximation, in this case, the cone has comparable almost intensity is not really. Uh, yeah, it's a tricky. Uh, is, uh, is, uh, is tricky, but um, the nice thing what we did here was to look at two case. At least you have double oh, information. Well. You can try to subtract one to the other. And maybe a second question, yeah. since I have the mic. Um, can you play a bit with the polarization of the pump? Uh, and does it like, can you actually uh, like uh, turn off or turn on some excitation just be, by changing the polarization of the pump? So in principle, with polarization of the pump, what we can play, uh, we can play for sure with the polarization of the pump. Uh, one could imagine, uh, you know, if, uh, for instance, as I mentioned before, here we have the opportunity to pump with mid infrared, right? Mid infrared, uh, Potential could pump with 300 mV. 300 mV means that uh, I could directly put a site from the balance band into the exciton, right? And then uh, there is a certain spin structure, so I could play with a circular polarization, for instance. We can do the, with that, we can play with the photon energy, we can play with uh, all the pump, et cetera, et cetera. We are commissioning, we're gonna do that for sure, yes. Other questions? So here you looked at 2K, but effectively you have access to six, right? Yeah. So would you learn anything more by looking at the four others? Would yeah. it help in a way? Yes, yes. Um, clearly this feature is present only along gamma M because along gamma M is where you have the minimum of the conduction band. So when you look along gamma K, you don't see this feature. So it must be really at the minimum of the conduction band where respect to have accumulation. When you look at the other K, we have a Fermi surface and you can just take three different cuts. Matrix element wise, very similar, very similar results. So if you look at just VDC at the six different uh, gamma M direction, very, very similar. At some point you said something about the spin texture that you yep. didn't come back. So the spin yeah. texture, so I think at this point is that uh, one of the strong evidences of this work for reporting the topology exciton is that the measure we did timer solve uh, ARPES with uh, with uh, with a VLID, so with a uh, spin resolution. And we observe that indeed after 20 picosecond, this exciton feature still shows a certain spin polarization. The claim of that the conduction band is spin unpolarized. So what we have, we have uh, the balance band that is uh, that is spin polarized and the exciton that is spin polarized, but is separated from the topological surface state and from the conduction band. In reality, in these materials, when you do spin polarized uh, spin arpes, you always measure spin polarization even from the conduction band. Uh, there is a very spin orbit coupling, conduction band and balance band are partially spin polarized. And here, where we observe the exciton feature is really at the edge of the conduction band that hybridizes with a spin polarized topological surface state. So I'm not sure whether you can really 
say for sure that that spin polarization is associated to an exciton or the bottom wave conduction band that feeds hybridization with the topological surface state. Right. Okay. Okay, so if there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker again.